starting a Sunday morning would not be to go to a talk about Python deployments. So just thanks for showing up. And um, let's get started. So my name is Cindy. And as Simeon introduced me, I have been working with Python for a couple of years now. So I think more than talking about what my history with Python has been, I think we should probably talk about what my history with Python deployments have been. So when I started writing Python in 2012, I was in grad school. And pretty much all I had to do was just write some Python scripts and kind of run them. And for the most part, you know, I, the worst I ever had to do was probably you know, grab a re, you know, requirement that was not installed on my local machine from PyPI. And I would try running pip install, blah, blah, blah. It used to fail. It used to tell me that my permission was denied and I, I couldn't pip install. So you know, I used to probably Google. It used to take me to a Stack Overflow page when someone said, just use sudo. So it's probably what I did, sudo pip install, it worked, my program ran, and everything was good. 2013 was probably when I, rec when I realized that there's this, there are a few more features to pip than just like pip installing something. So I probably wrote my first requirements.txt file um, to encompass more than a single requirement, and again, sudo pip installed everything. 2014 was, I suppose, when I first started developing web applications using Python. And most of these, and the easiest way to deploy a Python app would probably be to deploy to Roku. So how do you do that? Well, just git push Roku master, and your application is deployed, and your service is running, and everything is good. In 2015, um, probably I moved to a company where we were using Heroku, and we were also deploying a couple of things to an AMI on AWS, which meant that we were using Fabric, and all I had to do was, you know, it was there right in the readme, just to fab, pra, blah, 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 everything was good. And I just did it, and things worked. That was all I cared about. <coughs> Come 2016, and I joined another company where, well, we weren't really using Fabric anymore, so I was introduced to this thing called PEX and PANS, and was also using Docker, and they're called a couple of shell scripts. So, and in 2017, we are in the era of no ops and serverless, which obviously means that we don't Hopefully, in a year from now, we wouldn't be having to deploy Python applications. It's all going to be done for us. So before we get into the glorious, beautiful future, we still currently have to deploy our Python applications. So let's understand how that is done. So a brief outline of this talk. I'm first going to talk a little bit about what Python packaging really means. Talk about the history of Python packaging, how it evolved over the period of time. Talk about some common tools which you may have used, or at the very least, you may have seen. Just tools, pep, and setup tools talk to you a little bit about virtual env, talk to you about source and binary distributions, eggs and reels, pecs and pans, Docker. And if time permits, I'll go and I'll, I'll go a little bit into something called Nix. So first, let's talk about what is Python packaging. So before that, let's take a small interlude. And let's try to understand what Let's try to just reason about what we understand as Python. So Python is a programming language, one that is extremely delightful to program in. It's great, it's beautiful, a little code goes a long way, and it's amazing, and everyone loves it. So you're, typically, your first pro Python program would have been a hello world.py. And the way you run it would be, if you're using a terminal, would be to invoke the Python command and run hello world.py. And it would most likely would have printed hello world.py. So Python, as we understand it, is a programming language. But Python, as your operating system understands it, is actually a software package called the interpreter. So this interpreter is actually an executable file, an executable program that your system understands. Um, Python can also mean that you are talking about the standard libraries that comes along with your standard interpreter. So you can invoke Python using a script. You can potentially also directly in, in, invoke the interpreter by just typing Python in a terminal. You can also invoke Python using dash C or dash M. So what the C option does is allows you to run Python programs as strings. So essentially, you could potentially do this, and it will print the current date time. The Python dash M allows you to run Python modules. So now that we have an understanding of what Python really is, Let's understand what involves running a Python program. So first things first, your Python program is potentially going to run inside a process. So 
if you have a Python program running, and if you open another Tmux session or another Tremolo session, if you do px, psa aux grep python, it'll literally give you the process ID and all the other information about your Python process. So the, the way you run Python, or rather, how does this little Hello World program that you wrote turn into sort of like an executable program, right? So the way it happens in Python is that you have your source code, which is compiled into something called bytecode. And if your Python process has write access, that bytecode gets written to a PYC file. So if you if you've ever run a Python script and you kind of like, you know, after the execution is completed, if you kind of like see a bunch of PYC files in your system, now you know what they are. It's essentially the Python bytecode. And the Python bytecode gets fed to something called the virtual machine, the Python virtual machine, which essentially is just a big loop that iterates through your Python bytecode instructions to kind of like turn them into machine instructions and carry them on. So with Python, you just have your bytecode compilation that generates your PYC files. And like with C or with Go, you don't have any build or make step in Python. In other words, Python is a dynamically typed and interpreted language. So one thing that's really important to understand is that your Python bytecode is not the same as your machine code that actually gets executed. Um, you have the virtual machine that comes into that sort of like comes into the picture, which converts your machine converts your bytecode into machine code. And what we understand as a Python runtime in general is both the bytecode compiler and the virtual machine. So, like I just said, we so Python as we understand it requires both the bytecode compiler and your virtual machine to be shipped to either your hosts or even you, you need this even on your own computer to run a Python application. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So the next thing before we actually get into or rather, rather understand why deployments with Python is actually really hard would be to actually understand the Python import system. So any file ending in .py is something called a module. In Python 2.7, a collection of modules under one directory, which has an underscore underscore init file, is considered a package. What you understand, or rather what the word package means is that a package is importable. It can be imported by other packages in the same location. And um, I'm not really going to go into the intricacies of the Python import system. It's just completely Byzantine, and um, there are like several other links that you can um, follow to kind of like fully understand why Python imports are just kind of like just so hard. Well, not so hard, it's more like it's just confusing and like several gotchas. But um, at the very least, you have to understand that a package is something, is just a folder with a bunch of modules and an in it underscore underscore in dot py file. Um, in Python 3 though, this is in Python 2, and in Python 3, any directory on the sys.path with the name that matches the package name being looked for will be recognized as a, well, as a package, but that's Python 3, and all of us are on Python 2 and not on Python 3, so let's talk about Python 2 for now. Your Python path is an environment variable, which essentially tells your Python interpreter where to look for these packages, because um, a lot of you, especially if you're beginning with, when you were starting with Python, might have encountered the import error module not found. It's, it's fairly common, it just means that your, your Package is not in the Python path, which means that the interpreter cannot find it. And your Python path is something that can be dynamically changed using the sys.path command. And I would be surprised if anyone's been reading Python for any amount of time without actually ever having to resort to this. Your Python home, on the other hand, is another environment variable which lets you change the location of your standard Python libraries. And actually, you could just um, set it to a single location. So. Now we have an idea of what Python modules are and what Python packages are. So what does packaging, in other words, mean in Python? Well, again, like I said, in Python 2.7, anything with an underscore, underscore in it is considered a package. Now, a package from your operating system's perspective is something that is different. It, so in Linux-based systems or in Unix-based systems, you have this idea of having several packages come together to kind of like form um, to, I guess from executable programs, right? Because you, because in Windows and in Macs, you have like this sort of like everything that gets bundled together and shipped, which is great. But um, Linux-based systems tend to prefer modularity. So a package from an operating system's perspective is essentially a archive file along with all the dependencies and version number and the checksum that it requires to register itself with the package manager. So in Python, 
what an operating system calls a package is called a distribution. So your Python package itself is just like a folder with a bunch of files, a bunch of Python modules and an init.py file. Whereas what your operating system calls a package is something that we call a distribution. Libraries generally get bundled into packages and libraries may depend on other packages. So essentially the whole working system together, including things that could be potentially in the standard library, form a Python package. So let's understand a little bit more about the Python import system. So as I've probably mentioned numerous times already, any directory with an init.py file is considered a package. What we also don't know, what we probably might not know, is that any directory with a underscore underscore main.py main file is considered to be an executable. So python-m package will execute. So when you invoke Python with the dash m command, what it will do is it will try to run the package, the main file in the package if it exists. Another th interesting feature about the Python's import system is zip imports. In other words, your packages don't just have to completely exist on the file system as they are. You can zip them up and Python will still identify them as valid packages. This is because there's a hook that has been added um, to all Python distributions greater than Python 2.4, which um, allows you to do this. So now that we have an understanding of what Python packages are, and um, we know a little bit about how your Python interpreter finds packages in your system, let's, let's look at a brief history of Python packaging. So this is what it looked like. So distutils was the first thing that shipped in 1998, along with core Python. Then we had setup tools and eggs show up in 2004. We had pip and virtual env show up in 2008. And before pip, we had easy install, which I think just popped up sometime, sometime around 2005. Um, in 2010, we had distutils 2. Then we had in 2011 something called distribute, which was a fork of setup tools. In 2013, we had the first pep for reels arrive. And sometime during the period between 2011 and I guess 2012, Twitter also started working on a build system called Pants and an executable file format called PEX. In 2015, sorry, in 2013 was also when the Docker project was announced. And um, in 2013, I also believe distribute unforked, which means that it merged back with setup, setup tools. And in 2015 or 2016, the PEP for the many Linux wheels was introduced. So let's talk about the first things that came to the scene. That is distutils, setup tools, PEP and virtual env. So distutils, like I said, shipped with Python in 1998. What it allows you to do is helps you make an installation script. And then you can essentially invoke that installation script, which is called setup.py. And that will package your Python application for you. And when I mean package, I mean package it in the sense of how OS package managers understand the term, and not in terms of a Python package. So setup.py can build, distribute, publish, or install packages. So if you want to build something, just run Python setup.py build. If you want to publish something, Python setup.py publish. Now, a lot of people saw this as a flaw. Essentially, they saw this as a single thing that was doing way too much. And that was also one of the reasons why the distribute project was born. But um, that got forked back and, sorry, that got unforked. And that is, I wouldn't say it's not a valid argument anymore, but it's more like that, that's something that people feel. Setup tools came to the picture in 2004. And along with setup tools, we had eggs and easy install come into the scene. So setup tools is built on distutils. So it doesn't fully replace distutils. But what it does is it's slightly more fully featured than distutils. But setup tools does not ship automatically with core Python, which means that if you ever create a virtual env, if you ever create pip, what it will tell you is that it's installing setup tools, pip, and real. So they're like three things. Setup tools use easy install, which has now been replaced by pip. So what setup tools essentially does is, like I said, it doesn't replace distutils, but it builds on top of that. And for the most part, what it does is it monkey patches most of the utilities available in distutils for several reasons. So pip, a package manager that succeeded easy install, was introduced in 2008 to download packages from PyPI. It's a lot better than pip install in that you can list, upgrade, you can pip freeze, you can do a whole, it just ships with a whole bunch of additional functionality that distutils just didn't have, sorry, that easy install just didn't have. And Python 3.4 ships with pip, but Python 2.7 doesn't. 
And you can install pip using easy install. So doing sudo easy install pip will actually get you pip. So it's like use one to install the other. And pip has, pip I would say is pretty much the de facto standard currently for Python package managers. It's pretty much what's recommended. It's pretty much what everyone's using. Um, now let's talk about virtual env. So virtual env helps in achieving two main purposes. First things first, it isolates project dependencies. So with pip, you know that you can get your system, you, you can essentially get all the dependencies that your project depends on. But what if you have more than one single Python project, each of which depends on a different version of different libraries? You have a Python project that depends on an older version of requests and another one that's using the latest version of requests. And what you essentially want is to be able to isolate the dependencies on a per project basis. And virtual env actually helps you achieve that. Virtual env also serves a, another more important purpose in that it also helps you isolate system dependencies. And this is something that is extremely important to understand. And this is also one of the reasons why you should never ever pseudo pip install anything. So most of your operating systems these days ship with Python. If, unlike other languages like Go or Scala, I mean, I can't think of a single distro that actually out of the box ships with Go. But most systems actually do ship with Python. So what a lot of these operating systems require to bootstrap up is a functioning Python, working Python interpreter. And they ship with their own version of specifications, their own versions of libraries that they actually need. So if any of those libraries change or if any of those libraries get overwritten, your operating system itself might not, be, might not work as intended by the distribution, by the distributor. So when you go and pseudo pip install, like I was doing back in 2012 and 2013, you are potentially breaking your operating system because you are rewriting some of the dependencies that your operating system depends on. So never do that and always use virtual env. This is also important for another thing and we can discuss that when we get to Docker. So creating a virtual env is actually very simple. Pip install, user, upgrade virtual env. This actually creates a virtual env your user subspace, and if you just want to activate the virtual env, it's just this. Virtual env, like pip, now is actually a part of Python. It's called venv. It's available in Python 3 out of the box. The good thing about virtual env is that it also, for the most part, it actually shares a lot of, a lot of the common libraries and functions with your system Python. But when you, every time you create a new virtual env, what happens is that you are essentially creating a copy of the Python binary that is your essential C Python interpreter, a copy of the entire Python standard library, a copy of pip, as well as a copy of the site packages mentioned above. So there are several things that actually get created when you create a new virtual env. So let's now talk about estests and betas. What are these things? So every time you run pip install something, Right. You probably see a whole bunch of text that looks like spitting out. You probably don't care about what those things are. Like in the end, it just tells you it succeeded, you're happy. So, um, but if you ever just stop to look at like what are all the things that gets installed or what's really happening, you probably might see words like estes and betas and a whole bunch of other things. So, all right, so you have your Python package that you want to ship to other users. You either want to upload it to PyPI or you want to distribute it to some other party in your own company. How would you do that? One way of doing it is using source distributions. So source distributions essentially just comprises of your source files, that's all your Python files that you're cooking up, as well as some metadata about these files. And I have a very simple program called HelloPyBay as well, which has a setup.py file. So the setup.py file is something that's very, very simple, just like has just some metadata about this. Whereas here is a slightly more, um, I guess, a slightly more real-world example of a setup.py file. Um, this is um, grabbed from the new Confluent Kafka library, where um, which was actually released just like a few weeks ago. Where um, it's not a pure Python library; it has like a bunch of module extensions. So this is probably what a realistically a setup.py file would look like. So as I said, setup.py is built on top of distutils. So or rather, setup tools is built on top of distutils. So despite the fact that you're using setup tools, you also are impl importing things from distutils. And one of the things that you're importing is something called extension, and you're specifying a Python extension module, a C extension module, with this command. So now if I run Python setup.py as dist, what I essentially, you'll probably see something like this. So it's telling me it's doing a whole bunch of things at the end. Well, it tells me it's not succeeded. I don't know what's really happened. So let's just do an ls. 
And we now have two additional folders in our file system. One is called dist. And if you look inside what's, what's there inside dist, you have a tarball of Python. And if you look at the version, it matches the version we mentioned in the setup.py file. So we have a dist, and we also have something called this egg info. And if you look at what's inside the egg info file, well, it just looks like it's a metadata about our package. So that's how you essentially take a Python program or a Python, some Python code that you're writing. And if you want to package it up, just run, it's very simple, write a setup.py file, and then just run Python setup.py as dist, and you have a package that you can upload to PyPI. And other people can download that package and use your code. Sounds fairly simple, doesn't it? So what are some of the disadvantages of SDIST? The first thing is that it conflates build and install. So what you're essentially doing is you're taking all your source files, right, all your Python files, and you're creating a tarball out of it, and you're just throwing it on PyPI, which is great. But if I want to install your package, I'm going to have to download it from PyPI, which means all I'm going to get is like some Python source files. right? But I have to actually build this Python source file myself. And then I have to install it to my computer. So there are two different things. So let, let's assume that your package is pulling in five other packages from PyPI. When I download your package, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to install all the things. I'm going to have to grab all those dependencies from PyPI myself. So essentially, I am executing code. So if you, set, if you have a setup.py, you create an SDIS easy on your end. What I, ha I have to do, if I'm going to use your library, is I have to run setup.py on my machine again myself. So you have to do it to upload it. I have to do it as well. So essentially, that means that I am executing code when I'm trying to just pull a package which is not the greatest idea, which also means that it very closely couples build systems and installers. So what this means is that you don't have the, like I said, PIP is the de facto standard for installers, but you have different build systems. And these, um, just having to build and install a dependency means that these things are getting more closely coupled. Again, you just have to run arbitrary code. You have to run someone else's setup.py. You don't know what they've put in there. You could potentially be a cause. Could, potentially be a vector for attack in your system. It's also fairly slow because, well, I mean, for me, for getting a package, it's not quite simple as just like getting it from PyPI. I have to run some code. I have to like get it to work. And if in case it turns out that to, that your package depends on a whole bunch of other packages, then I have to install all of that. And that's like fairly, going to be fairly slow on my end. And imagine doing that for like several, a whole bunch of different packages instead of just one. It's also fairly hard to maintain in general just because of how closely coupled it's with things. So if you happen to be a package distributor and you're like, you have this package that you want like, to upload to PyPI, you have to make sure that you know, pretty much everyone else's installers and build systems works with your package. And again, like I said, it depends on dist tutorials and setup tools because someone who's going to download your package is going to run setup.py, which means that all these other tools that setup.py itself depends on needs to be in your system. So, Source distributions are fairly easy to package and upload, but they also have the disadvantages. So now let's look at something called BDIS, or rather binary distributions. OK, sorry. So these are essentially distribution files. Or rather, these are just distributions which just have files and metadata. So they don't essentially contain all your Python source code. And all that, needs, all that I need to do when I install a binary distribution is move all these files to the right location on my file system and it's ready to be imported, which means that I don't have to run setup.py, I don't have to do anything else on my end. It doesn't require a build step, like I said. It can directly be installed on the host, and by installed, what I mean is that it just can be moved to the right um, position in my file system so that, it, so, that Pyth so that it's set in Python path, or rather the Python interpreter knows to, to grab it from this file system location. So the way to, again, generate BDIST are fairly simple. You just do Python setup.py BDIST. And you'll probably be greeted with something like this. So if you look at look in here, there are like a whole bunch of things that says egg, egg something, something. You know, what are all these things? Let's try to understand what this means. Eggs. Eggs are a form of binary distributions. So one of the key principles of eggs is that they should be discoverable and portable because like I previously mentioned, one of, the, one, of the things, one of the key features of binary distributions is that you just have to move them somewhere in your file system location, and your Python program should be able to directly import them and directly work with them without actually having to like, install it, which means that it should actually be discoverable. And technically, you have to distribute it in a format that actually makes it importable. And there are two, basically, two 
formats that are implemented by eggs. One is the dot .egg format. So if you go back to what I said initially about um, zip files being executables and importables in Python. So you can actually import directly either from like source files or you can just import from a zip file. So if you just have a package and if you just zip it up, you can still import it. So eggs depend on that, on that feature. So essentially what an egg is, is just like a zip file contains the project's code and the resources, along with some metadata along with it. Egg info, if you look here, there are like a couple of things. There's like eggs and there are like these egg info files for egg info. Essentially it just contains some additional metadata that is placed adjacent to your, pack, to your program's code and it just makes the metadata more accessible. So now let's get to wheels. Eggs was, like I said, introduced along with setup tools back in 2004. Um, but wheels has since, I wouldn't say replaced it, but wheels definitely is the more modern version of distributing binary distributions. It's the new standard. Since it happens to be a binary distribution, there's no build step involved. Like eggs, again, is just a zip file with a specifically formatted name and has the .whl extension, like all their egg files that had the .egg extensions. So one thing that I didn't mention is that in general, the fact that both for eggs and for wheels, the fact that you don't have to build them. In, the, in other words, you don't have to run setup.py. What, what this means is that creating virtual ends using binary distributions is actually really cheap. And you can actually also tear them apart very easily because you don't have to recompile all the source, all the code from source. Um, wheels is supported by pip um, versions greater than 1.4 and setup tools greater than 0.8. And what happens with zip is, um, what happens with wheels is that essentially they're just zip files. So like I mentioned, again, to reiterate, with um, binary distributions, all that needs to be done is that these files need to be moved to the right positions in a file system. So what we do with wheels is that we just unzip them throw them into side packages or sysstart path, and they're ready to be imported by your Python program. So the good thing is that wheels have enough information to be later moved to the final paths, which is essentially side packages or just somewhere in your Python path so that your Python interpreter can import this code. The good thing with wheels, and, or the, rather the good thing with pip, is that pip these days, when you pip install something, it will automatically build wheels and it will cache them which means that if you want to pull the same thing, same dependency over several times, you're potentially going to be using the cached version, which means that your compile times are going to come down. So while eggs didn't quite have a formal PEP or a PEP, wheels have, if you want to know more about wheels, you probably should go read PEP 376. And what are some of the advantages of wheels? Again, no arbitrary code generation, rather no arbitrary code install execution for installation. So it's basically a binary distribution format. So that's good. So it's also a much faster way of installing both pure Python and native C extension packages because your package distributor or rather your package author has done all the work of compiling all these things and like putting it, give, giving you a zip file that all you have to do is just like download it and just like move it and move it to places in your file system. So it's much faster. Installation of C extensions doesn't quite require a compiler tool chain. Now this is, this is one of the biggest problems with source distributions, is that if I am going to be pulling something from source, and if that package tends to have C extensions, um, what that means is that I will not, not only need pip, which can handle Python modules and just like Python dependencies, I'll potentially also need a compiler on my own system, which can actually build all these C files. Because what a C extension is, in Python is that it essentially calls to other C functions. And during the build step, a lot of these C programs get compiled. So you definitely need a compiler on your system. And if something goes wrong, well, pip will tell you that it could not install your Python package with the C extension. One example would be PyCal, another would be PyOpenSSL. When it, if you're just trying to install these on a fresh host without a whole bunch of dependencies, you will ha require a compiler toolchain. And that actually becomes a problem because if you're, just if you're just moving Python code around, you don't necessarily want your end users to actually have the full compiler toolchain installed in your system. The good thing with wheels also is that you don't have to ship compiled Python files. In other words, you don't have to ship.pyc files. You can just, with, you, can, you, ju you, you just need uh, rather, Wheels has enough intelligence built into it to generate binary distributions just based on your source files. And it's also more consistent, consistent across different platforms because with Wheels, you can actually specify which platform you want to build it for, or rather, which machine you want to build it for. 
which is actually a fairly good thing. And the good thing, another thing is that as of a couple of years ago, PyPI was not accepting wheels for any platform or any Linux platform. In other words, you can only, only upload wheels for OS X and Windows. The reason behind this was because for OS X and Windows, they have fairly stable ABIs. What this means is that code that's compiled on one machine is very likely going to work on another OS X or a Windows machine. That is, however, not true with Linux. And um, until recently, PyPI was not accepting. You can upload many, or you can upload Linux wheels to PyPI. But um, a lot of that changed with um, PEP 513, which was introduced this year, which actually specifies a format it actually doesn't specify a format. It basically has a spec for generating Linux wheels. And if you meet certain conditions, then I mean, if you meet certain conditions, then you can, or rather, your package will be accepted by PyPI, and it can be eligible for a many Linux platform tag. So how do you create and upload wheels? Because wheels are so great. Well, if your Python package is not using two to three, which is a module used um, to automatically make your Python code compatible with both Python 2 and 3. It's fairly simple. Just do pip install wheel, pip install twine, which is another program, which, make, which is another package, which makes it really easy to upload things to PyPI. Python setup.py is just b dist wheel, and twine upload slash dist. So when you run Python setup.py b dist wheel, what's going to happen is that, as we saw in a screenshot a few slides before, it will generate a dist folder with pretty much everything included there. That can be shipped to another machine and will just probably have to be unzipped and just move to the right position. And try and upload dist will actually upload your wheel to PyPI. If your project is Python 2 and 3 compatible, then without using 2 to 3, then you can actually create something called as a universal wheel. All you need to do is just drop a setup.cfg file and just mention b dist wheel universal equal to 1. Now, this is in many, in, this is in actually some cases not the right way to do things, or rather it's not um, the advised way of doing things. That is because if your program has C extensions, then it's advised not to push the universal wheel, because pip in general prefers the universal wheel version or the source code. And as we just saw previously with, um, with Linux-based systems, you cannot um, reliably just make sure that Packages compiled on one system work on the other. So I did mention that one thing that Wheels really helps us do is um, makes it platform and Python interpreter independent, which means that you can, I don't have to worry about the fact that Wheels generated will essentially work everywhere. And how, how this is ensured is basically based on the naming convention. So if you actually look at a wheel file, it's something, it's named something like this. So first you have your distribution version. So here's an example. So I have a file, I have a package called PyBay that I want to distribute that you've probably seen in the previous slides. And it has a, so that's PyBay, then there's a version, then there's an optional build tag, which um, tells me what version I want to build. There's a Python 2.7, which tells me what version of the Python interpreter I want. It gives me my ABI tag, which gives me my platform tag, tells me which platform I want to build it for, and has a real extension. So this is, if you, if you care more about it, it's basically the whole process of how you generate a B-dist wheel. So I'm running out of time, so let's talk about pecs and pants right now. So just to recap, what we've learned until now is that we have packages that we want to upload to PyPI. There are two different kinds of distributions. There are source distributions and binary distributions. Binary distributions are much preferable over source distributions for a whole number of reasons. But yet, if you actually look at PyPI for a large number of packages, even fairly I wouldn't say popular ones, but there are quite a few ones for which um, wheels or binary distributions don't exist. So all you have is the source distributions. But pip is good enough that it can actually build from both the source distribution, though if it can find a wheel on PyPI, it will prefer that. And we learned about how to build wheels, and we also learned about how to build eggs and how to upload them to PyPI. Let's understand what PEX and PANS is. So if you actually, go, if you actually remember the slide, the whole um, history of Python deployment slide. Um, PEX and PANS came into the scene in 2011. It evolved out of a project called Twitter Commons. So before we get into that again, let's just recap again what is meant by a Python package. So any directory with an init file is called a package. 
Any directory with the main file is treated as an executable. We also know that in Python, we don't necessarily, sorry, that in Python, your packages can also exist in the form of zip files. So it's kind of what I'm doing here. I'm just creating a directory called zip, zippy. I am creating an init file, which obviously makes sure that this package is executable, or rather this package is importable. So when I actually do python-c input zippy.help, just tells me, can this talk end right away? I just want to get out of this room, right? So what I'm telling you is, you know, I'm just telling you, hey, it gets better. Python packaging is not that bad. Don't rewrite things in Rust or Go because all this is a little too hard to understand. So we're creating another file called zippy, and we're writing all this to the main file. So now if we run zippy, essentially what we're seeing is that it runs, despite the fact that it has an init file, which we described here below, we have called the help.py file, which is like a cry for help. There's also a main file. When we, run just, when we just run this package, zippy, what it runs is that the main file. Great, so let's understand something else. We also know that zip files are also executable and importable. So we're taking our main file and we're zipping it up. And if you actually just run Python, if you essentially just run a Python zip file with a Python command, it's still printing out the same thing. So PEX is something that builds on top of all these features. So another feature of Python is that if you actually have a Python script, and if you have a shebang user bin and Python on top of that as a first line, that converts a Python file into an executable file, which means that if you, let's say you have a file called PyBay, which just prints hello world. The actual, so in the previous cases, the way of actually evoking this file is saying Python hello world.py, which will actually run the file. If you just drop in a shebang, user bin and Python on top of that file before printing hello world. You can just let, literally just say pybay and it'll run the files. So essentially, that's how you create executables in Python. Command line, if you want to create command line utilities in Python, you'll literally just like drop this one line and it'll do what it does for you. So in this case, let's create a file called pybay.pex, where we're essentially taking our zip file and copying it over to this file called pybay.pex, and we're converting that file to an executable, which can either be done using the um, sort of like just dropping in the shebang line in the, in the beginning, or you can potentially just change things yourself with the chmod. And now if you actually look, if you're just executing python.pex without even invoking the Python command, you're actually seeing that the file is being, the Python file is being executed and you're seeing some output there. So pex actually builds on top of all these things. So pex files are just executable Python files. So what's the benefit of having executable Python files, right? So what you can do is you potentially can take your entire project, your entire Python project, and build a PEX for it, which means that, oh, I mean, in the most cases, what you essentially, when you're talking about Python deployments, you want to deploy a Python web application, or you want to deploy some kind of daemon service that does something. And one way of doing it would be to kind of like invoke it with the Python command on your end host. Another way of doing it would be to create an executable and then just invoking it like you would invoke any other executable. PANS is a build system for Python. So where does it get its name from? Python ants. Or rather, the way I say it, it's the build system that launched 8,000 jokes. <laughs> so these are like some things that I pulled out of my company Slack channel. So there's like some mention of things called entry points or some mention of targets. You know, someone's complaining about how long it takes to build. And during the meantime, while they're waiting for things to build, they also posted a comment about some, how cool Kubernetes is. And there's actually a timestamp in there. Basically, the blog post tells you what date it was, and that's important. And I included that for a reason, because this was about a year ago. And then we realized that there's another build system called Buck by Facebook. So we decided to take off pants and just go chase the buck. Right, so you should look further. You know, it's like obviously someone just posted a link, hey, go look at Buck, and they see someone, check Buck out for five minutes and tell me what do you think. And what they found out is that it is used for building monorepos. From that seems doesn't seem to be very happy. So a lot of people seem, don't seem to be very happy about that. So let's understand some of these things. So we, we saw a word called target, we saw something called entry point, we seeing monorepos, what are all these things? So PANS, as I said, is just Python ants. It's a build system built at Twitter. It's based on uh, a build system that's used at Google called Blaze. Um, PANS 
was, I think the past project started back in 2011, but um, since I think Google very recently open source Blaze, it's called Bazel now. So um, Facebook have their own tool called Puck, Google have Bazel, LinkedIn has something called PyGradle. And the, thing with, the good thing with Pants is that it supports building a whole bunch of other things. It's, it's polyglot, it's not just for building Python. If anyone's interested about like a different comparison between the different build systems, then this is it, but probably not gonna to linger too much on this slide, there's nothing much to see here. So let's talk about pants. So one of the things that upset one of my coworkers is the fact that Buck was basically built for monorepos. Pants, again, is designed for monorepos. So what are monorepos, really? Monorepos are just large, growing repos, right? Like monorepo. Well, actually, no. Monorepos is a concept that was pioneered at Google and now seems to be like catching over at all the other bigger companies, where pretty much everyone, every ex-Googler goes to work somewhere else, they probably bring the whole idea of monorepo. Essentially, it just means that having all your code, not just your Python code, but pretty much all the code used in the company under one single repo. So at Google, they have probably what feels like billions and billions of lines of code under one repo. So I mean, I was asking one of my friends who worked at Google, like, it just seems so bizarre that your Android source code is going to be in the same library as your Go source code, which is going to be in the same library as all the code used for Gmail and search. And like, how the hell does this work? And she was like, yeah, that's how it is. We'll stick forever. But you know, there are like a lot of advantages to it. And she was like, if you're ever, ever wondering why dependency management in Go sucks, it's probably because it was born out of the idea of monorepos. So monorepos have their benefits. I mean, I've never used, with, I've never used monorepos. I've never worked with monorepos myself. So it's just something that I pulled out of the pants documentation. So I'm just going to have to take their word for it and just say that, well, if you say so, I believe so, that monorepos have all these benefits. Don't ask me. I don't know myself. Um, so pants, but, so let's, that's a caveat, that pants is built for monorepos. That's that pants does have several advantages. Gives you fine grain invalidation. It also has a very fast and a, both a local and a distributed build cache. It also allows for concurrent task execution and incremental compilation and extensibility. So in PANS, the, the basic unit, like as we saw before, we were creating setup.py files for building Python packages. In PANS, you just have something called a build file, which describes targets and goals. So targets in Python just translates to a single Python package in general, and goals describe what you want to do to your targets. So if you actually just run PANS goals list, this is kind of what you get. If you actually look, there's like a goal for clean all, which someone told me yesterday, which is used internally at Twitter for saying that, hey, did you wash your pants? Because clean all just completely cleans all the build files, right? So the build system that launched 8,000 jokes, like I said. So this is essentially what a build file for pants looks like. So you have your requirements. In this case, it's just a requirements.txt file. You have Python libraries. You have a Python binary. So Python libraries, again, are called targets. Um, and these just correspond to single packages. So the idea, I mean, you can have potentially several other packages squashed into a single target, but the best practice is to kind of like have the level of granularity that's best suited for your um, repo. And you can also see that in the, under dependencies, we are like specifying several other dependencies, both which include like other package, other libraries. We're saying that like controllers depends on models, controllers also seems to depend on Stripe and Prometheus clients, which are essentially um, dependencies that you get from a requirements file. And at the end, you create something called as a Python binary because PANS uses pecs underneath the hood, right? It's just like an easy way of generating pexes. And pex is an executable Python file. So essentially, we are statically compiling Python to get a binary out of it. So you need to specify what your binary is, rather what your entry point is. So that's what the Python binary commands do. So, so PANS seems to be a great way for doing a lot of things. Right, so you have like these sandboxed Python environments, Python executables that you just need to drop on some system, and it just works, which is great. And Python and Pants also solves this problem that has plagued um, virtual env in that virtual env relocate. I think command it just never really works. And if you actually look at the virtual env documentation these days, they literally tell you that the feature is almost going to be deprecated because it doesn't work and it's not something that is recommended. But with Pants. You, or rather with pecs, you can build pecs and you can sort of like move them around to just different environments and you can pretty much bet that your Python dependencies, your pure Python dependencies are gonna be well captured and gonna be working the same way in different systems. So that is one thing, but what are some of the drawbacks of pants or rather what are the, some of the drawbacks of pexes? Here's something what my coworker is asking me. How do you include C dependencies in your pants build? The way, well, the thing is you really can't. 
pants doesn't really cross across your doesn't really step outside of your Python Python's build. So Pax allows you gives you a way of creating a sandboxed Python environment. But if you have say a C Python extension, what that's essentially going to do is probably going to call into some of your C libraries that's installed in your system. And if it has a runtime dependency to a couple of these C libraries, when you're compiling or when you're building or when pip is building something, it doesn't necessarily tell you that you know this thing is, it doesn't exist. Or rather, the version that exists doesn't match the version that this library is expecting. So Pants doesn't really isolate, or rather, Pex doesn't really isolate any of its build time dependencies either. Because if things don't exist, it's just going to fail. And another drawback is that it pr uses your system provided shared shared libraries. You cannot specify that unless you're going to like hack your LE library path flag and like do some things. With, Throw in some hacks. You can't with pants. There's like no elegant way of saying I want to use this version of libc or I want to use this version of OpenSSL for this build. So then, let's get to the last topic of today, which is Docker. <sighs> Docker, the new, the latest hotness, was released in 2013. Fun fact: the initial version of Docker was actually written in Python. So Python distributions are too hard. We all we have to do is just use Docker, right? So essentially, when you talk about Docker, you might have seen something like this, you know, as I'm throwing them buzzwords around. So what really is Docker? Well, Docker is a container. Well, it's, you know, it's a VM replacement. It's build, ship, run, anything. But I've also seen a whole bunch of like these really buzzwordy things. And like people just say, you know, just use Docker. Python plus Docker is just Nirvana. Well, not really. So what really is Docker, right? So Docker provides you certain promises. Don't bother re re reading all this. Just like read what's like in red. Just as the software always runs the same, it has all these dependencies. You don't need extra dependencies, and you just need to like build once, run anywhere, blah blah blah. And a lot of these things actually hold water. A lot of these things are actually true. When I started my current company, all I had to do to get a working Python environment, to basically start programming, was just kind of like pull a Docker container, run my test, and I had a green test build. It took like five minutes. At our previous company, we had this really complicated Vagrant setup where I had to provision my Vagrant box, and it felt, it felt like it was just downloading the entire internet, and it failed a few times. Then I think after an entire week, I finally managed to get a working test suite, which meant that it took me an entire week just to kind of like get my working environment set up, whereas in my current company with Docker, it took me like five minutes. So Docker most certainly has its benefits. So we asked ourselves, what is Docker? So Docker is a container runtime. And I'm going to go into what containers are, what image formats are. A lot of these things are maybe familiar to you people. There are a ton of other resources on the web to understand these more um, better than anything I can just say in like the last five minutes I have. Um, so Docker also does a lot of things. So it's like a runtime for containers, an image format. It also rebuilt the whole networking stack. and like like a few releases ago, and it's like a process manager, it's a cluster scheduler, and all of these things are compiled into like one standard gigantic binary that's running on root digital system. Docker specifies the Unix philosophy, does too many things, and tries to do all of them really well. So OK, so that's Docker, right? So what we are most concerned about is how is Docker going to help us solve our deployment problem? I just want to deploy a Python application with PEXs and with virtual ends. I have, or rather with virtual ends, I can isolate my Python dependencies. And with PEX, I can make sure that the same things can be shipped to different machines. PEX do and PANS doesn't really have an answer to my C dependencies. So let's see you know, if Docker still helps me solve that problem. So a lot of people, when what they do wonder when they start Docker is that, you know, do I still need to use a virtual end? The answer is yes. You still need to use a virtual end, even if you're using Docker. The reason was because virtual end solves two problems. One is like it isolates project level dependencies. And the second thing, what virtual end does, is that it isolates system level dependencies. And your Docker container is most likely going to build, be built out of a CentOS or a Ubuntu base image, which means that these base images are going to bring in their own Python along with their own different versions, different dependencies that the Python that they, these base images rely on bring. Right, which means that if you're just going to like go and sudo pip install inside a Docker container, great, you're doing this inside a Docker container. So your host operating system, or rather your bare metal servers, Python environment is not probably not going to get corrupted. But you're still opening yourself up to a lot of corruption inside your Docker container. Do I still need to build wheels, even if I'm using Docker? Well, yes, because wheels are a distribution format. Because even inside a Docker container, you're probably going to be pip installing something, which means that pip will have to go fetch wheels from PyPI. And it's either going to fetch wheels or it's going to fetch source distribution. So might as well just upload wheels to PyPI. Does this mean that the dependency problem is solved for good? Sadly, no. And the reason is because 
Docker out of the box doesn't really solve your C dependency issue. There's no way that, so it reduces the surface area for attacks and for a lot of different things and reduces the surface area for, I guess, file system corruption because now we have your own file system that is isolated to a single process. Great, but what that doesn't solve is the fact that a lot of shared libraries that you're using are still the one provided by the system. And um, which means that your C extensions, or when you're building a whole bunch of like C dependencies, they may not work as expected. So with Python, we have solved the problems of isolating Python dependencies by kind of like putting them in their own namespace. How do we solve the problem of isolating C dependencies? Docker doesn't really, like I said, help you solve the problem out of the box. And the last thing, and I don't have time to get more into this, is the system called Nix. So Nix was born out of someone's PhD thesis in the Netherlands. So essentially what it does is it namespaces not just your Python imports, but literally everything that you need to run a certain application. So that includes glibc, that includes OpenSSL, like pretty much anything and everything you need. If you want to build a Java application, then if you want to specify a Nix um, config for that, if you want to create a Nix package for that, then you have to literally include which version of JVM you need. So what Nix allows you to do is, since it gives you a namespace for not just your Python, but for pretty much every single dependency that an application can ever depend on, including things like libc and JVM, you can potentially on a single host have five different versions of JVM. You know, you could have like just five different versions of glibc, and all these things are isolated, so that building one or changing one thing essentially isn't going to go and change things on the other end. And that's all I have for today. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I don't have time to get into everything because I think I spent way too much time initially on like S this and B this and things like that. But um, yeah, thank you.